On that note, we'd like to move ahead to our next live case study. This is the fourth live case study on the topic growth levers for setting up of a marketplace. Are you all doing great this afternoon again? Did you have a great session? Yes, yes? Fantastic. I want to see you all smile a little bit more, keep your mobile phones a little bit aside, and then join us here right here. Please put your hands together as I invite our moderator to join us on stage, and that is Mr. Naman Vijay, CEO, Click Post. May we have you on the stage, please? Naman is an entrepreneur since his college days. Naman started his journey at IIT Delhi, and after a stint at Barclays Bank, he co-founded ClickPost in 2017 with a mission to democratize commerce and empower the upcoming online retailers. ClickPost is now helping 200 plus enterprises like Puma, Nike, Purple, etc. improve post-purchase experience for 15 million plus shipments on a monthly basis. Please put your hands together once again to Mr. Naman Vijay. Welcome. I would now like to invite our speakers to please join us on stage. I'd like to start with Ms. Vaishnavi, our co-founder, The Nestery. May we have you on the stage, please? Vaishnavi is the worker-in-chief at The Nestery in what feels like a previous life, she says. She was a senior consultant at Deloitte Consulting. Her biggest strength and ability is to truly connect with people and with a strong mindset. Everything that she does, she's learned with patience, perseverance, and hard work. Well, put your hands together for Vaishnavi, who's right here with us. Thank you. I would now like to invite on stage Mr. Murli Balan, co-founder Tenovia. May we have you on the stage, please. As he walks up, please applaud as loud as you can. Muli is the co-founder of Chinovia, an e-commerce analytics and consulting firm that has over the last decade focused on building and scaling e-commerce of revenues for brands through expertise in technology, marketing, and analytics. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I would now like to invite on stage Mr. Rakesh Jaiswal, business manager of Winkilim, to please join us on stage. Ten years of professional experience in the print, digital marketing, and e-commerce industry. SaaS currently working with Winkilum Solutions Private Limited as a category business manager. Please put your hands together once again to Rakesh. Welcome and a big, big warm welcome to all our panel members and our moderator who's joined us here. I hand over the session to you, Mr. Nabil. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to the session. Thanks for taking the time out and. Uh, before we start, just okay. Before we start, just a bit about the session topic. So, growth levers for setting up a marketplace. Why is it important? I think Dashna from Winklum when she called me and we were just brainstorming upon the topics that we want to choose upon. Suddenly, marketplaces come up, and I, I'm like, this is my topic. I want to dig deep into it. And the reason is very simple. So, we at ClickPost, whenever someone new joins in. There's a session that I take, which is kind of like an initial training session, and it's about Indian e-commerce, a historic view on it. And we go into when the first Indian e-commerce companies started becoming big, the Flipkarts, the Snapdeals, the Shopclues of the world, right? So you had horizontal marketplaces coming up around 2010, and then vertical marketplaces started coming up, so Nikas, Lenskarts, Pepperflies of the world around 2014 vintage. And then you have new age marketplaces coming up today, which is like Nestry, you have me show, you have Swiggy, the session just before this. So it's kind of expanding the market and bringing more and more users online, playing the most critical uh, role in Indian e-commerce, which is getting more consumers to spend online. And this is why like, I think just the growth of marketplaces pretty much drives what all of us are trying to do, which is growing Indian e-commerce overall. So that would just like to start the session and I think initially we would start with Vashnavi. Vashnavi, a quick, a quick intro about like Nestry. How did you come up on the idea? What is it leading to? What, what are you guys planning? Thank you so much for having me here. Um, so the Nestry started in 2019 uh, purely from um, a personal need, um, the need for context, the need for better discovery when it comes to 
products in the mother and child category. Uh, that was kind of where the Nestle started. Uh, it's been a crazy three years. Um, and uh, today we have like 30,000 plus SKUs on the platform. We work with almost 500 brands. And more importantly, we get to see uh, smiles of kids pretty much every day, which kind of makes our day. So that's, that's us. And where do you think it's leading? Like, what's the entire vision going to be five years from now? Where do you think Nestle would become? So um, the vision with which the Nestle is built is to help parents discover products better. So for me personally, what um, I want the Nestle to get to is a parent coming in and just saying, hey, my child has a cold. And me able to, or the Nestle, or the platform being able to say, hey, these are the five things that you need to be looking at and nothing more. Don't get overwhelmed. Hey, these are the five things that you need. Like, uh, I think earlier in the day, I heard this example of iPhone. I think, um, it, it, like, about how when you go and look for an iPhone, you see 444 pages of listings of it. But when you don't need as many, right? Uh, the whole idea is to get, uh, to reduce that load on that parent to help them discover better. That's, that's the vision. So when we think of marketplaces, like I personally get scared of marketplace ideas. Like I'm, I'm running a SaaS company. We build a product, we sell it. Everything is under control, right? But when you're a marketplace, you have end consumers who are demanding as always. You have brands who have their own demands. And you as a marketplace owner, you have your own needs, your investors, you, are, you have your own PNL to run. How do you kind of manage all of these stakeholders and like what is it you look at? Um, thankfully, we are three co-founders. So we have kind of our work cut out um, in terms of like what kind of the, what uh, type of the business that we, we all, each of us look at. Uh, but as a practice, all of us have this practice of speaking to between five to 10 brands on the supplier side every single month, whether or not we have any like active work to do with them. And on the customer side as well, we aim to speak to at least five to 10 customers compulsorily, like at least for like 20 minutes per person every single month. Um, this has really helped us find that line to kind of toe. As we scale, there will be different kind of challenges because in the early stages, like you can aim to, you know, balance that line between customers and brands. But as you scale, the, the scale kind of always shifts towards the customer. Uh, but it it's always helps when you keep your ears open to the brands and listen to what they're asking for. Um, in fact, something that I constantly hear that I know Murli's team works on is when we speak to brands, we constantly hear that, hey, I want uh, more information on how I'm performing on your marketplace, right? Um, like, where do I see this information? Like, how do I see how many people are landing here? How, like, what kind of products do well? How are competitors of mine doing on your platform? So these, this is information that I, like, I constantly get asked. So like, I kind of really resonated when we spoke uh, briefly earlier that like about Tenovia's solution as well. That's a very interesting point of view because when we think of analytics softwares, there's a lot of talk in town about consumer analytics, right? But there's a whole different set of analytics that you can run towards brands as well. Muli, uh, like, can you throw some more light into what Vashna you just spoke about? Uh, yeah, so if you, I mean, from the, uh, if you look at the marketplaces today, right, you'll see Amazon at the very top providing all the analytics that is helping its sellers scale up. And all other marketplaces are various levels below them. So what uh, we are trying to do with, uh, with Tensai, our, our analytics product, is to bridge that gap. So, so a marketplace can actually then provide its sellers the same kind of tools, insights, uh, which help its sellers scale up. And, and that's a very important part of the, of the equation, right? The seller side uh, uh, app, I mean the seller side the seller-facing uh, entities that marketplaces can sell as customers. Because if the sellers can scale up, I mean, the marketplace itself scales up, right? So the kind of insights that they need, which, which Amazon does provide, is how much inventory to keep in, I mean, for that particular marketplace, at which warehouse, at which time, right? 
uh, what, how do they compare vis-a-vis -vis the other brands on, those, on that marketplace? Because it's important to index yourself with your competitors. Because that's, and if you can help your sellers at scale, they feel supported, they'll then do stuff for you, which is because, because they know that they, you're also caring for them, right? Or giving them the tools to succeed. So, so that's what we are providing to the marketplaces as a plugin, working with, uh, uh, with Winklim to provide that as a, as a, as a plugin on top of uh, its uh, marketplace solution. And, uh, and that's what we do for brands, right? Who are selling on various marketplaces, right? So, so this is data that has been aggregated together across every function of e-commerce to, to really make those decisions that have to be taken at speed much faster, saving loads and loads of money, right? I'm sure the AWS team in the audience would have loved hearing that. But yeah, I think that's the truth today, that we are all kind of like chasing what the big guys have done. And Rakesh, like uh, what Morley just spoke about, can you throw some light onto like how marketplaces scale up and at what point, what sort of tech interventions they need or what, that Winklem can provide? Sorry. So uh, definitely. So see, uh, as, as a Winkleum, right? We help the mark. We are not just helping the marketplace in terms of as a technology partner, but we also help them as a business partner, right? From a technology perspective, I'll talk about. So we help the marketplace to complete their end-to-end -end journey. So let me uh, give a one live case study. So we work with the largest category-specific marketplace in India, right? Uh, we uh, started helping them in terms of providing our order management and warehouse management system, uh, which helped them to manage the orders and fulfill the orders directly from their warehouses, right? Now, once this got stable, we, uh, the brands moved to the seller fulfillment model, and uh, we helped them to deploy our seller fulfillment model, right, which helped them to manage the seller's orders and the fulfillment. And similarly, uh, we implemented the multiple use cases for them. Right, uh, so uh, which includes like omni-channel store fulfillment, seller commission, seller commissioning model. Right, uh, the journey was so wonderful that uh, they started with us with 50 orders, and presently they are processing 150,000 orders from our system. Uh, see the uh, the the reason behind uh, to note for this journey that our complete product stacks are modular in nature, right? Basis on uh, the brand's requirement or the marketplace requirement, they can pick and choose, right? Uh, it's like a Lego model, right? So we have the end-to-end -end solution for a marketplace. We have product called PIM, which helps the marketplace to create the product, to publish the catalog on their web store. We have order management system, which help the marketplace to manage the order and route the orders to the respective sellers so that respective sellers can fulfill the orders to the end customer. We have seller panel, right, which help the sellers to take our orders and fulfill the orders to the end customers. We have a commission calculator model, which help the marketplace to reconcile the payment and also help the marketplace to release the vendor payout, right? So this is how we help from a technology perspective. If I talk about from a business perspective, so yes, as a Winkelum, we work with a lot of brands and sellers across the globe, right? So how we help the marketplace that are, we help the marketplace to onboard Winkelum existing sellers on their platform, right? So that a brands can get an additional sellers on their platform and for a seller benefit, right? They will get an additional sales channels for their business. Right? So this is how we help uh, any marketplace to grow from level zero to uh, next level. Very interesting analogy. Over I there. would actually yeah. like to jump in here. That yeah. is the last thing that he mentioned is the primary use case for which like, we started speaking to Viniculum. Because uh, as you scale from an early stage, when you start going to bigger brands, uh, you realize that you need to have certain tech, tech, you know, technical capabilities for you to sort of harness the kind of inventory that they have, like, or the products that they have, the catalog that they have. So, uh, Viniculum kind of makes that really easy because it gives you access to a ready set of, uh, you know, larger players that, like, you can readily bring to the table. So, for us, that was, like, one of the main triggers for us to speak to Viniculum. That's very interesting in the sense that you felt that there was a trigger which was driven by your customers, which is brands in this case, 
and you felt that you uh, needed a technological solution for it. Um, would love to know about thought process uh, around this a little bit more. Like when you think of technological solutions, what are the trigger points or how has that journey evolved from early days till now uh, in terms of like evaluating or even deciding when do you need a tech solution in place? Um, so in our experience of three years, I think uh, it can be fairly like broken down into three stages. The first stage is when you think you can solve everything through Excel. <laughs> That's like right at the very beginning. Uh, but then, um, you know, there's a time and place for an Excel, like obviously, and that go gets away very soon. Uh, then you move to, let's say, someone who's able to set a process, but someone who's just able to get you from point A to point B, right? But the biggest trigger that makes you move towards a more mature solution is, I think, uh, intelligence or like data, because uh, that's where I think like a more uh, mature solution really helps, right? And as you grow, the only thing that helps you take meaningful decisions is data, right? Like 90% data, maybe 10% of intuition or like 95% data and 5% intuition, but that 95% data needs to be there, right? And that is kind of has been the trigger across functions for us to shift to more uh, mature software. I correlate with that Excel statement so much. In SaaS industry, we have a saying that all of us will build tools to kind of replace Excel. And at the end of the day, the product manager will come in and build a function to kind of export everything into a CSV or an Excel file, right? So, but as a founder also can correlate so much with that uh, thought process that initially you are kind of like in a hustle mode and then you kind of like get into, okay, let me just build some processes in and then you are looking for more data and like intelligence. Uh, so Nestry just onboarded ClickPost. Like was that one of the trigger points for you as well? Yes, it was. Uh, so, uh, so we have an OMS in place. But the thing is, um, logistics, as I have heard throughout the day, is one function where there are so many leakages here, there, everywhere, right? Um, and it is one of the one functions that impacts customer experience so tremendously. Because there's such high expectations set by, you know, an Amazon, let's say, yeah, like by Amazon, that uh, everyone expects everything tomorrow, or like today or 20 minutes later, or 10 minutes later, right? So uh, it's, it's the one function that can have such tremendous impact on customer experience. So uh, when we spoke to ClickPost, the whole point was like we were doing, we had an earlier solution that we were using. But then we started speaking to ClickPost because we wanted more intelligence. We wanted to get to a point where it's not about a human deciding, hey, yahan pe surface jayega or yahan pe express jayega. It needed to be automated, right? Uh, so that's that's really where ClickPost really helps us determine, you know, like if it is A and B pin code automatically assign it to, you know, let's say local delivery. Or if it is X weight or like, you know, Y weight, then assign it to a B2B shipping. So that kind of logistics intelligence, like logistics intelligence and uh, the second most important part of it for me to work again on my processes from the point of order to put the point of delivery is like really massively helpful. And I, and I actually think ClickPost goes beyond that. Like I heard infinite in the morning somewhere when it comes to customer experience. Um, you guys also help with the returns management. So that's, that's again massively helpful. Like as you enter new categories, when you're not a team that like, we are not a team that believes that everything needs to be built from scratch, right? Uh, so that, that really helps. Thank you. <laughs> so Murli, uh, you guys have worked with a lot of brands and marketplaces as well. And I think you would have seen the journey that Vashnavi just spoke about in terms of like how the tech stack kind of evolves. Can you give some more insight into like across brands and marketplaces that you have worked with, how their journey has evolved? Uh, yeah, so, so for, a, for a successful marketplace to launch and sustain, right, you need to stitch together a bunch of different tech pieces along the way. So, uh, so, so while, let's say, Winklum powers the OMS, WMS of it, and, and, and there is part of the Lego stack that, that uh, Rakesh was talking about, but you need to also think of um, your CRM integration, right? You need to think of your 
your headless commerce. You need to think of your user experience uh, at the front end level. You need to think of search uh, and discovery. So, uh, and that's important because it, the inventory plays such a key part and that's changing by the sellers, right? So, so you've got to stitch all these pieces together and, and that's solved by different platforms, right? And, and, and so we've helped a lot of brands as part of our services business to actually help establish that stitched together product, right? Where maybe we are solving the, the stitching together part of different platforms uh, or different products together, um, as well as maybe the, the, the store built front in whether it's Magento or custom built platform or uh, Shopify, right? But, that's, but stitching together is the key. And, and that, that, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the user experience to the front end customer, right? That, that you have to solve for at speed, at scale. Uh, and for that, some of the biggest aspects is how the data flows between these platforms and your own DevOps stack. So, so those are key aspects to think of as well. So just digging deeper into it, do you see marketplaces then kind of prioritize a specific function at a specific point of time that, hey, there might be three things that may be broken and like in businesses there's always multiple things that are broken. But do you see that when you, when you give like a holistic sort of a view, um, marketplaces might decide to kind of like just prioritize one rather than a couple of others? Uh, yeah, so, so, so with Tensite, our, our e-com analytics product, uh, we, I mean, we power the analytics for a lot of brands, right? And what it does is that it provides you a, a holistic view of maybe 200 plus metrics across the main six functions of e-commerce, right? So it's almost like a balanced scorecard or an OKR uh, dashboard, but it gives you that view of, of how the function is. So your marketing cannot be extremely strong, whereas your supply chain is weak, because then you're spending dollars which are just trickling down various gaps and being wasted, right? So it's a, it's a balanced scorecard that has to be, I mean, stitched to, I mean, you need to know where you're losing money, right? So when you have analytics across the board coming to you and, and maybe at the C level or the C minus one level, you have access to that, uh, practically real time data from all your data silos. Your decisions are faster, right? You can know where, which areas, first of all, a weakness and then act on that so that your revenue stops, I mean, your loss of revenue can be stemmed. And, and that's, that's provided, I mean, what we see is that typically brands are create, let's say if a brand is doing about 100, whatever, crows, lakh, whatever it is, right? They are creating demand for 140. So 40 crows, lakhs, whatever it is, is being wasted because of supply chain issues, marketing inefficiencies, and so on. And, and when that data comes to brand uh, or own, I mean, managers, it's, it's alarming, and it's, it's actionable, it's insightful, and all that. But, but that's what's happening at, I mean, across the board. That got, we were also stunned by it. But, but uh, it's a lot, lot of wastage, and, and we, we're trying to do a bit to minimize that wastage. Vashnavi, has that happened with Nestri, where you were you kind of surprised with either leakages or something that you felt was working OK, but it was just too broken when you looked at numbers or data? I think, like you said, at any given point, there are like five different fires. Like, yeah, yeah it, it always helps like for us to focus. Like, I know that currently our focus is on product, right? Uh, because like as we grow, like that's the one thing, like my premise is to help parents discover, be discover products better. Right, for me, that is the one that is on fire at this point. So yeah, it, it keeps changing. And like Rakesh, uh, in your experience, like how does Winklum help over here kind of better strategize in terms of scales? Let's say I'm a brand that's just setting up a marketplace, okay. right? Versus someone who's scaled up already. See, uh, it is completely depend on the marketplace, how they construct their journey. Basis on that, they can pick and choose, right? We uh, talk about the Lego model. We also understood that how technology can be deployed basis on the marketplace requirement, right? Now it's a call of a marketplace leader, right? They need to decide what is uh, good to have, what is must to have, right? Basis on that must to have, they need to decide the relevant technologies to implement uh, for their business, right? But uh, in our experience, it is always advisable to uh, go step by step right, understand their business needs and basis on that implement the relevant technology. 
Great. Uh, Vashini, just one more question over here. When you are selling to brands, like, what's your pitch? Why should they work with more and more marketplaces? Uh, why does it uh, matter versus working with just one or two marketplaces? Um, like, from the brand point of view, like, I, I mean, I can only answer, like, what I pitch to brands. Like, there are only two things that any brand looks to a marketplace for. One is volume. <laughs> And the other one is, uh, you know, visibility sales. Like, mm -hmm. it, it, it all like, comes back to only volumes and visibility. Um, so that's, that's pretty much where our pitch lies. Yeah. And uh, it helps that we operate in a space where there are not too many players. Uh, so it's, it's a great space to be. Great. Thank you for that. We would love to have some questions from the audience as well. Anyone? Yeah, I see uh, a hand at the back. Hello. So I have a question. Basically, uh, this uh, session, this uh, particular case study is about data analytics and stuff. So, at what point of time a company or a startup should uh, uh, shift to these uh, tools or basically uh, companies like yours? Uh, to you know, from shift from Excel to your tools, basically, I want to understand. That's a great question, Vashnavi. Any trigger in terms of numbers that number folders or GMV, etc., that you can put over there? I don't want to put a uh, like an odd number of orders trigger, but you'll realize when like you need more than one person to operate that Excel is when that is broken. You need to move to a system <laughs> because. That's when all the formulas start failing. So yeah, uh, I, it, that that has been our measure of moving away from Excel. Although like we moved away from it quite fast, but uh, that that was a good measure. Like the minute two people started touching the same tool, like it didn't work the same way. <laughs> the magic failed. Can you give an example of like that tool and uh, like did you ever go through? I'll I'll actually give you an example which is related to what you guys do. So at the very very beginning. Uh, so we had an Excel tool. Uh, so we are on Shopify. Okay, Shopify, as you know, is not made for marketplaces, and uh, it doesn't split orders. And as a marketplace, you operate with like so many vendors. So uh, we built an Excel tool that basically splits every order by vendor. Okay, and then um, it creates a format which is ready for upload into any delivery platform, like logistics platform, right? In their CSV format. Uh, the minute it took more than one person to start using that, we're like, okay, this doesn't work anymore. Yeah, so that that, that was the point. That's so interesting to hear. <laughs> Moli, I think you are. Uh, I, I think just to my take on that is that uh, if, I mean, if your operations are in place, right, you're doing everything across all functions to a basic level and you've crossed that, right? So you know you're you're delivering, I mean, everything can be improved, but you're, you're active on various marketplaces. The big flaws are not there, are, are solved by your team. The next level of growth comes through analytics, right? So, because, I mean, you'll get optimizations, but you'll get accelerated optimizations through analytics, right? So, so that's my uh, take on that. I'd just like to add to my answer, the place where I said Excel breaks takes you to your first tool. The next tool, as he said, is when everything starts working in process, that's when we have moved to analytics and where we have relied tremendously on intelligence from various platforms. Rakesh, any thoughts like when you are selling uh, to people, what is that point where you say now you definitely need something? See, uh, uh, to answer this question, the business owner itself, they realize, right, uh, what level of volume they are doing and what all the challenges they are facing to manage those kind of operations, right? So. The question is also there in the hand of a business owner and the answer is also there in the hand of business owner. We are just a facilitator. Uh, definitely we can, we can uh, discuss, decide and we can give a right solution to them at what stage, what all the solutions basically uh, they can deploy to streamline their business operations and uh, to, to know growth for their business. Great. Questions, more questions? Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay. Yeah. I 
Does this analytics take care of the demand planning part of the D2C also, in terms of what kind of inventory, what is the dynamic inventory that it fluctuates? Yeah. This so, is the traffic and... I mean, so, so very specific to Tensite, what, what it does is that it knows what inventory you have in every warehouse that, that is across your value chain, right? And it knows the rate of sale by SQ, by warehouse. And as a result, it'll tell you uh, what will run out of stock by when. It knows the replenishing cycle. So it can actually predict, saying that to avoid an out-of-stock scenario, replenish at this point because this is the lead time. And, and if you don't do it, it'll also tell you how much the loss of sale in action has cost, right? Which is the hard-hitting aspect for a lot of supply chain heads. <laughs> so no, no, the, the, um, so I, I, as she's told, you know, we have these Excels, uh, the great Excels and the formulas in place and, and it works. But it works to an extent because the dynamism of the sales fluctuation is so high that it, it I mean, our analytics does two key things, right? It takes care of your category seasonality. So even if you've launched a new product and it's, it, it's, it doesn't have any historical sales, your category uh, sales trends for those months will also influence how much this new product will sell, right? And then the other thing is the own product. If it's a if it's a replenished product, it has its own history as well. So it bakes in those two things. I mean, it's it's. I mean, there's a lot of learning that it does across a lot of SKUs uh, itself, and it and then predicts how much you should have, right? So and and typically we're we're seeing about a 87, 90 percent accuracy in a model. So uh, uh, and and we. I mean, and that's a you don't want higher than that predictability as well because then it it's skewed too much towards uh, towards one category and so on so so, so industry wide 90% is a is a very good uh, yeah it's, it's acceptable it's, it's very very good now i am coming from the point i'm sorry i'm asking the same questions again and again i'm coming from background of a grocery products and grocery products are un unlike any uh, electronics does not have a it has a huge amount of shelf life issue and being a consumables, it has a huge amount of governments. I, a lot of, uh, you know, consumers, uh, you know, expectations of freshness. And also the rules of uh, an e-com player about a freshness level that we can sell to a consumer. So it becomes a very tricky situation when we, different, uh, when we have a different categories with different shelf lives. Uh, some with this, which is 45 days, like chocolate, some which has only two months. Some it has, you know, does not have a shelf life. So to maintain between and stagger between them with and good analytics is the key thing which I was kind of uh, now looking at. Uh, yeah, 100%. And, and I think if you add the fact that there is different demand in different pin codes or different warehouses and you merge that together, then to where you're sourcing from, your, your request itself becomes sharper, right? I need this kind of inventory in this warehouse and, and based on... So you add demand uh, over and above the historical data, what you predict, I mean, the trend lines, you get a lot more accuracy, right? And, and basically trying to reduce the inefficiency of your marketing so much, make sure you're capturing as much of that demand out there. Thank you, thank you. Very interesting to hear how the complexity kind of increases with the categories, uh, with the scales, and with so many different variables coming in. Uh, Vashin, you just a second level question over there, like what goes into your planning around sales and discounts? Like what are the different variables? Let's focus on sales for a second, right? In your category, what all variables do you think of when you're planning a sale in terms of dates and what, what are the things you would provide in the sale? Um, okay, so when we plan for sales, uh, first of all, one of the most important thing we do is demand planning. Like we, uh, like although we don't have that much historic data, uh, but we still look at you know, how, we, like, especially the uh, the industry that we operate in has a lot of seasonality, right? There's summer vacations, there is, like, there are different vacation breaks where sales kind of peaks. There are significant dips at different points of time. So we look at seasonality, we look at, uh, you know, uh, at what point of the year where brands are launching new products. We look at sales velocity historically and look at what kind of inventory we need to be replenishing. Uh, we look at price parity and like at what prices other play, other folks are selling at, like especially if you're selling comparable products and if you're able to move that dynamically, right? Uh, these are just some of the things that we look at. Like obviously it's like a really long list. And how are you managing that from a tech standpoint? Um, 
so uh, we work with some solution providers to uh, to manage this like we, we moved excel? away from excel like on <laughs> all fronts like not on all fronts you can't you live can without never excel <laughs> cool uh, lovely to hear the thoughts uh, any other questions from the audience i see a hand over there hi uh, my name is vignesh and my question is to murli uh, i wanted to understand about your analytics tool. Uh, so is it the sales demand forecast that you do? Is it based on velocity of sales or rate of sales? Uh, it's based on rate of sale. It's based on rate of actual sale, based on when you have inventory. And when you're out of, out of inventory, it doesn't calculate that. Okay. It's, it's doing that across warehouse locations, across channels, uh, uh, across all your 3PLs. If you have, if you've out, I mean, if there are other sellers that you're selling, who are selling your product, does that too. Uh, so, so it's it's planning at scale at a at a category level, uh, at a subcategory level, at a channel level. So you're you're replenishing on time as much as possible and avoiding slippage of demand. Right? That's that's what it does at scale. Um, uh, something Vashmi said is that it's about competitor tracking as well. Right? So, so our whole objective is is to look at data cross functionally. Right? So, so you can predict, but if you can also then link that up to your marketing. Uh, automatedly, right? Or link it up to your discounts that your competitors are giving again, and and put that in terms of demand planning. You get you get better influence data, right? So okay. so that's I mean, does that answer the question? Yeah, fair. Uh, I totally got it. Just to summarize what you said, uh, you do consider only the sales that happens when the SKUs are on live on the platform, right? So you Correct. do track that. Yeah. Okay. Vignesh would actually love to know some more context around that question because it felt like it came from a personal experience or a problem that you are currently solving, not, if you can give some color to it. Not really. So I actually, the question got triggered from my colleague's uh, question, actually, when he asked about demand forecasting. I think, by and large, I think most of us, the challenge that any brand would face is to crack the velocity of the sales problem, right? R because most of us go through the rate of sales funda. But there are very uh, few places or few brands that actually go by the velocity of sales and kind of forecast their demand properly, which kind of is challenging also. Right? So that's why I wanted to understand if his tool does take care of that or not. So maybe I'll catch up with him offline. Yeah, you should definitely catch up offline on that one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so can you have a mic? Add on to my friend's question. Uh, does your uh, data, uh, like your uh, software, help to take uh, input from something like IMRB or uh, some kind of ORG mark data with the categories you're dealing? So that what happens, that becomes an input. Maybe uh, that toy company that lady is doing, if she can give a predictive analysis, does it allow that kind of uh, input? Uh, currently, no. Uh, but what we do is that we do uh, share of voice demand signaling on marketplaces or on own brand dot of competitor brand dot com right so so it gives you e-commerce related demand uh, data uh, but it's not considering offline data yet right so so it's a uh, it's a request that we've heard before from our customers saying that uh, especially in fmcg there is for those brands who have done that uh, research uh, uh, they want to integrate that and and that's something that we're I mean, we haven't gotten to it yet, very honestly. But but at least on your marketplaces, so let's say if you're selling a, a category, right? You might have search terms that you care about. Uh, you can actually then see how, where you stand versus your competitors. So based on share of voice itself. Mm -hmm. And that data is predictive of demand, right? Of your volume demand and is it increasing? If that can be uh, tied up with marketing as well, you can actually see the impact of marketing on that and then and on the reverse side, you can see the impact of loss of, uh, of, enough, of not enough uh, inventory planning. As it is, I mean, your share of voice can go down because of uh, you haven't planned it well enough, right? And, and so it just stitches up together. And, and our objective is to reduce your loss of sale. That's, up, that's, that's why we exist. Cool. Thank you. I would actually ask a follow-up to Vaishnavi over there, uh, kind of related to the question. Do you, while you are running the marketplace, use any offline signals? It might not even be data, but like intuitions or any other signals from the offline world uh, in how you, like which brands you onboard or anything else while running the marketplace. So the one exercise in terms of 
uh, customer voice that we do uh, that is not related to what's on my platform is uh, as part of talking to customers, we talk to people who have never heard of the Nestry, right? Or they have heard of the Nestry and they've never bought from us or they've never come onto the platform. Like they may have heard of it in like some WhatsApp group, but they've never bought from us. So that kind of gives us very rich insights uh, as to like what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, like what is the biggest pain point, why someone doesn't buy with us. So that's a very useful exercise. Very interesting, kind of like just talking to maybe people in your target customer segment, but people who are not like, who are definitely not in the pipeline right now. Uh, Rakesh, uh, do you guys help uh, marketplaces or brands kind of like get information of where they stand, et cetera, uh, in comparison to like other customers that you have? Uh, see, information's perspective, uh, uh, definitely not completely, but uh, from a technology perspective, we help the marketplaces to grow X level, right? As I already mentioned, that we work with the marketplaces uh, as a business partner as well, right, where we are helping uh, the marketplaces to add any additional sellers on their platform. Uh, required to that, whatever the activity basically needs to be done uh, between both the companies that we do, right? Yeah, more but, questions? Yeah, sorry, more. Murli, are you integrated with, yeah, are you integrated with Viniculum? Yes. So, uh, the question is to Viniculum and uh, so if if I go with your tool, uh, will you be able to generate an auto PO basis your demand on Viniculum? Not yet. Not but, yet. Uh, so so we are integrated with their orders that are flowing through. So so we get that view. Uh, I think in terms of other possibilities of the use case of that, we're working on it. I mean, so it's it's early days on that. Okay, so do you do any analytics basis if you can pull the data from there and work on the uh, the data of the inventory in terms of the aging, in terms of, the, you do that? that? That part is there. That is already there. But then once your analytics is through, I, you will, I will still need to manually post it and get the PO generated. Yes, currently. Okay, sorry. That's a live feature request. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Amit and I'm from Fossil. So my question is around uh, demand side. Uh, so when you said that uh, share of voice, your, your platform captures share of voice, right? So does your platform uh, do it at a attribute level, at a category level, subcategory level? I'm, uh, so this is specifically for new launches. So when uh, any brand, when they launch any new product, they always uh, try to get some ideas from the competition, from the category, from the platforms, this is the customer inputs, right? So does your platform has that capability? And if yes, then is it based on images or attribute level? So, so attributes, um, so, so we do, I mean, share of voice based on uh, multiple factors, right? So, so one is uh, based on your search terms where you stand. Uh, even if you're not in a category, we, we can help look, make, I mean, you might be looking at a new category to enter, and maybe you might want to look at three months of data in that category before you enter, right? So today we are helping brands uh, plan their, in fashion, plan their uh, two seasons away in uh, designs itself, right? Based on what's trending on those categories uh, uh, from the current marketplaces and, own, and some of these competitor brand.coms. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's one. Um, second is every all this views available category and subcategory level, right? So, so there is category and attribute level. So, so when we work with let's say brand, uh, we know from the product master all or for your competitors all the sing, every single attribute level which is published on a marketplace page or their own brand.com, and that is, I mean, so there's crawling data that comes to you, uh, organized by various aspects and then visually presented to you in a consumable manner. Absolutely, because uh, what triggered this is that if I want to look at a data which can tell me that a black a black dial watch with silicon strap, 42 mm uh, dial size, sells the most on this platform, then that can act as an input for my brand team to develop such product. Correct. We also link all the uh, so so. Let's say you have 10 cust I mean 10 competitors that you want to track, right? We'll tell you what are the trending products 
of those competitors in the last three months, six months, what new products they've launched, because we're crawling all these competitors every week, right? So, so yeah, then your merchandising team gets those live feeds as to, so that they can actually source better or manufacture better. Yeah. A quick follow-up on that same question is that uh, while uh, estimating the forecast of a new product, do you guys only go into attributes or also into image of the product? Uh, not so much the images right now, just on attributes. So, Got but it. that's, that's, I mean, uh, that's something that our team is working on. Got it. So, I mean, uh, from an experience standpoint, what we have uh, realized is that uh, a black dial silicone watch can be a best seller and a worst seller both. <laughs> because it finally depends on how everything comes together, all the dials, every sub eye. The final look is what the consumer really buys. Correct. But so that's where, let's say, we merge that data with also the, the ratings and reviews of, the, of that product or all products of the competitors on marketplaces. So you sift the noise based on the customer feedback as well, right? So giving you that particular uh, attribute combination, what is the average rating from a customer feedback perspective, which is already happening for your competitors, right? So again, enriching the recommendation layer that you are giving to your merchandisers. I think Moli needs to give a demo of the product. Yeah, happy to connect <laughs> yes. offline. More questions. Would love to have more questions on the crowd. Anyone? Going one, going two. Okay, let's close the session. Thanks, everyone. This was really nice. Once again, let's give a big hand to our moderator and all our panel members. Thank you. Thank you so much.